Hey, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to session room three. So speakers, when you share your screen, please use the application window tab. Please mute your microphone if you're not speaking because we can hear all the feedback noise. Uh, if you're playing a video, same thing. And uh, don't forget that there's a Q&A session at the end of this. Um, so please stay on the call and uh, so you can address questions at the end. And so we're, we're going to switch things around a little bit. Um, Abby Wiesner is going to be our first speaker and Praveen's gonna jump on in when he can. He's had a little glitch. And so I'll just introduce, I'm running two computers right now and I've got two mouses and I always seem to pick the wrong one. So our first speaker is Abby Wiesner. She is a graduate student at the University of Guelph completing her master's degree in environmental sciences, investigating the biology, behavior, and management of box tree moth in Toronto. Her background is in entomology, specifically related to invasive insects. And some of you know Abby because she was our nursery scout in 2019. So a lot of you know her really well. And I know her really well, and she's lovely, and she's going to be talking to you about her research. So take it away, Abby. All right, thank you, Jen. That was very nice, and uh, Jen's uh, wonderful as well. <laughs> um, just looking at the chat, I want to make sure that everyone can hear me as well while I bring my presentation up. So, All right, so hopefully everybody can see that. Well, um, hi everyone. Um, as Jen said, my name's Abby, and today I will be talking to you guys about the integrated pest management for box tree moth. Now, uh, many of our listeners today um, may be aware that boxwood is a popular landscaping choice. Um, but if not, uh, I, I have a ooh, lovely photo here for you. Um, sorry, <laughs> the, the presentation, the animation seems to be a little off. Okay, well, there you go. We'll have it just overlapping for now. Um, but pictured here is an example of how boxwood is used uh, as hedging. And this was actually taken at the Hillside Gardens in High Park, Toronto. So um, as I said, you know, the health of boxwood plants is going to be the focus of our discussion today. So here on the left, you know, this is very characteristic. It's a green, luscious boxwood. It's very healthy. I took this uh, in May of last year. And then only three months later, at the end of July, I went back and this is what that plant looked like. As you can tell, it's lost all of its leaves. It probably won't survive in this condition. But what has caused such dramatic plant damage in such a short time? Well, um, there is a newly invasive insect pest called box tree moth, and I'll be referring to it as BTM for short from now on. And this is the pest that's causing that dramatic plant damage. It's actually native to East Asia, but since 2007 has spread to over 30 European countries. And in 2018, it was identified in the neighborhood of Etobicoke here in Ontario but let's get to know this pest a little better. Boxwood is the pest's primary host and all four life stages shown here by the photos can be found on the plant year round. Now, moving from left to right, we have the eggs. Uh, let me get my laser pointer here. So the egg clusters uh, are very flat against the leaf surface. Yellow can be very conspicuous. Then we have the larva, their black head capsules make them a little more distinguishable, the pupa, and then the adult stages. Now it's the larval stage here 
what people uh, commonly uh, refer to as the caterpillars, they are the ones that are causing the plant damage. And they do this, as you can see, by consuming the plant foliage. Now, although there can be up to five generations in the native range in Asia, luckily here in Ontario, there are only two generations occurring between May and September. And then they also overwinter in their larval stage. Lastly, it's important to note that the potential dispersal rate of this pest per year is seven to 10 kilometers. And this is done by the adults, which are the mobile stage. But let's ask, why should we be concerned about this pest? Well, not only is BTM causing damage to our beloved landscaping plant at the homeowner level, but it also poses a threat to the industry. Boxwood is a slow growing, but a high value crop. And many of you will know that for producers, it can account for 20% of their production line alone. Now, overall, the horticultural industry is economically important in Ontario, and it yields billions in sales annually. So we want to protect that. Secondly, although we know that the potential dispersal rate is seven to 10 kilometers, we're unsure of how it will happen here in Ontario. We don't know what the rate of geographic spread will be. It's very fortunate that BTM hasn't been found in any commercial site yet, uh, but tracking its spread out of its current urban setting in Etobicoke is a top priority. Additionally, or in addition to um, uh, what we need to know about tracking the spread, there is also a lack of information regarding how BTM will behave biologically here in Ontario. And this is referring to um, the characteristics such as the number of generations and what time of year those generations and those life stages will be present. This information is really important to understand and it will inform all subsequent management decisions. Uh, lastly, coming to those uh, management options, currently we have very limited control options. Um, right now, our only recommended product is any biological insecticide containing Bacillus thuringiensis, or otherwise known as BT. Uh, such products as BioProtect Plus, Dipel, or Zentari can be used, but uh, just please note that before you use any pesticide in the landscape, consult the list of active ingredients authorized for cosmetic uses and the allowable list. But, you know, another or an additional level to why we're concerned about uh, this limited control option I'm sure you're aware that BTM has a very short environment, environmental persistence and if its efficacy can be highly influenced by environmental factors. Uh, additionally, uh, resistance development is still possible with BT. So it's really imperative that other control solutions be identified so that we can have sustained management of BTM in Ontario in the future. Well, now that we've got our concerns out of the way, let's talk about how we're going to address these threats. Well, research efforts are, been, are being undertaken by the University of Guelph in partnership with the University of Toronto and Landscape Ontario. The first two objectives listed here will be my focus, while Landscape Ontario will be tackling the third. My objectives are to determine the status of the pest in Ontario. Like I said, this relates to biology, population ecology, and behavior throughout the year. Additionally, we want to track that dispersal from the original detection site in Etobicoke. As well, on top of this, we want to evaluate the efficacy of registered and novel insecticides on larvae for BTM management. Now, like I said, Landscape Ontario will be developing the protocols and best management practices that will be uh, used for nursery production. From these objectives and by conducting the research now, we hope to uncover critical information 
which will inform all subsequent actions. You know, as I said, uh, if we know how many generations there are and what time of year they're active, and then bringing in that information of where they're present, we can apply management where it matters most. And then by identifying the supplementary control options, we will have a robust list of strategies and hopefully confidence in our management plan for both residential and commercial use. Uh, and then Landscape Ontario developing all of those protocols and practices. This will provide producers with action-based plans and standards that will ensure the continuation of the market both locally and related to international trade. Let's go through what we figured out so far, you know, following our objectives. Well, through monitoring efforts, we are beginning to understand BTM's biological behavior here in Ontario. From fall to early spring, the young larva can be found in an overwintering structure. Um, this is a webbed cocoon and it's called the hibernarium. So if I have my, hopefully you can see my laser pointer here, but this is the type of structure that I am describing. So the larvae are actually tucked inside this cocoon in a suspended state. Now, as temperatures warm in early to mid-May, the larva will emerge and begin feeding on the boxwood leaves. The early instar larva, and this is what the L1 to L3 is referring to, so that's those immature stages of the, the larval development. They only consume the surface of the leaves. Whereas as they grow and as they develop into late instar larvae, they will consume the entire leaf structure. Throughout this entire period of the larval development, this first generation will be active between mid-May to mid-June. And so this is indicated here. They will reach adulthood by early July, which completes the first generation. Now, the second generation, the eggs will be present in July and the caterpillars, the larvae will emerge and be active from about mid-July to mid-August. The adults of that second generation will be present in early September, which completes this generation. Abby, you've got about three minutes left. I'm just chiming in to let you know, okay? Three or four minutes, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll <laughs> quickly go through this, but overall, uh, the takeaway from this is that there are two generations occurring in Ontario and they span from May to September. Um, in terms of the dispersal zone, we know that they are still present in the urban landscape of Toronto, but we are focusing our research and our scouting efforts in this orange area, the surrounding areas. But as you can see, that's a lot of area to cover. And so we're asking for your help. And I'm going to talk about how you can help. So the first best step you can take is that to inspect every boxwood plant you come in contact with. This inspection can be really quick and doesn't require any additional materials except for your eyes and your hands. Now, what you really want to do is to move apart the foliage, lift the branches and, and look into the interior because even though the exterior of the plant may look green and luscious, there could be caterpillars feeding and hiding within. With every inspection, if you do find BTM, we want you to record the date, the location, and then take any photos. The photos will be a great way to document what you're seeing and also uh, help anyone that you're going to talk about your, your find um, to describe what you're seeing. Now, again, the best uh, opportunities for larval detection are mid-May to mid-June and mid-July to mid-August. I do have a quick video here. Um, it doesn't have any sound, 
but it's just to show, see the plant on the exterior doesn't look affected, but as you open up the branches, you can see that the interior it is quite dusty looking. And this is because the larva have consumed foliage, leaving behind webbing and uh, frass, which is just their excrement. Now, any sightings that you find should be reported to either the Canadian Food Inspection Agency or uh, Landscape Ontario. And um, I'm gonna have to quickly go through this, but this presentation will be distributed afterward, so um, you will have this contact information. Um, if you'd like to be more personally involved in our research, we are actually looking to engage citizen science volunteers. And this is a really uh, big component of our project to cover that extensive area. Now we're looking for volunteers to host a pheromone trap, which is pictured here at the top right. It will be installed on your property within seven meters of a boxwood plant and contain a special lure that will attract only the male moths. And as you can see here on the bottom right, this is what they look like when they're captured on the sticky card, which is inside of the trap. Um, as the citizen science volunteer, you will record the number of male moths per trap on a weekly basis and report those numbers to our research team from May to September. And if you're unsure of if you've actually caught BTM, you can always take a photo and include that in your report to help our research team confirm identification. Lastly, um, I know, Jen, I am a little bit out of time here, but I really want to stress the importance of uh, understanding management and disposal. Now, uh, we did already talk about monitoring, but I cannot stress it enough. Successful management starts with regular inspections and accurate identification. Once identified, um, complete coverage of products containing Bacillus pharyngensis should be applied and making sure that all of the uh, parts of the plant, interior and exterior, are covered. As a biological insecticide, um, it must be ingested to be effective. So this is only applicable to the larvae which consume the plant material and is not effective against eggs, pupa, or the adult stage. After treatment, uh, the plants should be inspected within five to seven days to assess if it was effective or if another application is warranted. Um, and additionally, uh, these treatments need to be repeated during each generation of larva, and that's again, mid-May to mid-June and mid-July to mid-August, because um, uh, as we know, biological insecticides are not persistent within in the environment and will not protect from a uh, reinfestation. Lastly, if you do need to remove plants, um, we ask that you contain all plant material in black garbage bags, you seal tightly, leave it in the hot sun for a few days, and this will ensure that any specimens have died before disposal. Uh, sorry for going over a little, uh, over time a little, but I'd like to thank my supervisor, my advisory committee, and funding support. So thank you uh, to all of you for listening. And uh, you can ask questions during the question period, or if you want to get in contact with me for a little bit more of in-depth discussion, uh, my email is listed here. Great, thank you so much, Abby. So for those of you that are listening that might have uh, friends or family that live just outside the GTA, we are looking for citizen scientists uh, to host a trap on their property because we're looking to see where box tree moth could potentially be spreading outside of the greater Toronto area. And um, <clears throat> those management uh, strategies that Abby gave you would be very um, useful for residential and that would be awesome if you guys know some people put them in touch with us because we really do, do need more trap people.
All right, thank you so much. And next uh, we have Sean Fox. Sean, if you are ready to share <laughs> your screen. And while he's queuing up, Sean is the manager of horticulture at the University of Guelph Arboretum. And there he oversees the Arboretum's nursery and more than 30 woody plant collections, representing over 2,000 different taxa of trees and shrubs from around the world. And during the past 20 years, Sean has paid particular attention to the regional flora of Ontario. And his work in the Arboretum has been directed heavily toward the conservation of threatened trees, species, and some of the lesser known species that are hiding right under our noses. Welcome, Sean. Oh, thank you very much, Jen. Um, yeah, before we get started, thank you again for having me and Jen and Amy for all the work you've put into uh, putting this whole thing together. Uh, for any of you attending last year, uh, you may remember me speaking about species diversity with amelanchiers or surface berries. Uh, and I think as, as propagators and horticulturists and botanists and landscape architects, we're really lucky to have these groups that we, I don't want to say we take them for granted, but they're, they're workhorses. They're, they're very... Um, diverse, uh, used for, for restoration work, for ornamental um, urban plantings, but we sometimes lose sight about how diverse these groups actually are. And that's what I want to share a little bit with you all today. Um, just getting started here, you can ask the average person on the street to identify an oak and they will have a pretty good idea, at least of some of the common ones, um, kind of looking at, at a, a leaf silhouette like this with these pinnately uh, arranged lobes on the leaves. So again, there's there's the kind of common ones, red oak and white oak, but most people can kind of recognize them this way. Uh, the problem is though, is that you're, if you're just relying on leaves, they can be quite diverse as well. So this is just a small selection of some different species of oaks. So the uh, upper two in the top left here are certainly ones that uh, we would recognize probably as an oak leaf shape but uh, many of them have very, very diverse types of lobes, like the southern red oak, which is very different than this northern red oak that we see here. Uh, some have, have teeth, look almost more like chestnut leaves, um, and others don't have any lobes or any teeth at all. So it's a very broad group, and you can't just rely on leaves to identify them. Now, those leaves can look like other members of the broader family that they're in. So the Fagaceae family, in this case, uh, we know the, the beeches, uh, the fagus and the castanias, the, the chestnuts around here, as far as things that are cold hardy in our region. There are a number of other species that are more subtropical or Mediterranean or, or even tropical. Um, and again, they can be um, uh, you know, quite diverse as groups. They do share characteristics with the oaks, uh, but certainly there are those distinct things that separate them. And in the case of, of, of oaks, uh, acorns are another big thing. Most people, even from a young age, kids will recognize acorns, the nut with the cap, uh, can be quite diverse. Uh, things like the stone oaks in the previous slide, the lithocarpus also have acorns, although they have uh, a different uh, type of bud structure, a different type of floral structure. So as we look at, uh, at these slides here, you can see the compound buds in the upper right corner. Uh, at that the uh, the clustered buds at the terminals, which is pretty distinct for oaks or Quercus, and also the floral structure. In this case, these are the male flowers, the male catkin flowers that shed pollen. Uh, not usually necessary uh, to know these really well for, for separating species from one another, but can be very handy, certainly. But it does separate them from the castanias and the fagus and some of the other uh, genera that are closely related. And again, those acorns, if you're in Ontario and you see the nut with the cap, you can feel pretty safe um, that you're looking at, a, at an oak or a Quercus. And that uh, range of, of, uh, of shape and size and color and the type of cap is really, really uh, quite beautiful, uh, very diverse, but also very useful for identification. And you can see that here just in a few, few photos I dug up where I actually was using the same hand and same angle, which was kind of handy as I was trying to pull, pull together photos for this, these slides. But uh, obviously, there's hundreds of photos of different acorns that are really, really uh, beautiful to look at when you take a close look at them. And the diversity itself is, is pretty remarkable. Uh, this publication, the Red List of Oaks uh, 2020, was, was just put out uh, as an update to a previous document. Uh, it was done by the uh, IUCN and Botanic Gardens Conservation International and the Morton Arboretum. 
And it's a pretty extensive uh, look at, at uh, profiling uh, all the species in the world. So 430 oak species are estimated globally. So it's an amazingly diverse group. Um, estimates can go up towards about 600. And that's depending if you're classifying uh, distinct things as hybrids or subspecies or varieties. But there's 430 species that are actually documented here. Um, sadly, 217 of them, 41% are of conservation concern and 112 of those are critically endangered. So that's basically looking at imminent threats of extinction. So it's diversity that we are also losing very rapidly as well. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of what that looks like, uh, 117 of those species are in China. And looking at uh, the photo here, this is a uh, sawtooth oak, which is a, uh, as you can see, not a typical leaf shape, but, um, but very kind of jagged uh, teeth on it. And uh, one of the species that you'll find there. And actually Mexico has the most diversity in the entire world, 164 species. And they're actually capturing a lot of the, the more Southern species in Central America and also the Northern edge of Mexico, some of those species that are, are, are generally ranging for, further North in latitude, but still hanging on in, in uh, North Mexico uh, that you, you see more commonly in some of those in the US as well. But uh, a lot of diversity there. If you ever have a chance to go trekking uh, in Central America and certainly in Mexico and, and try your hand at identifying them, it's, it's, it's a fun amount of work. Um, I certainly don't know, know, know very many of them myself, but, um, but yeah, you can keep busy for a lifetime trying to identify all those species. And then the U.S. remarkably has 91 species, and that's something that probably would surprise a lot of people. They have a lot of the same ones that we have, and they're very broad spread and common. But if you look more closely, there are a lot of them, um, especially some really uh, special endemic ones on the West Coast and also some further south, kind of the Florida Panhandle and, and the Gulf Coast there. Um, so, yeah, if you look closely, you'll find some of those really rare ones in those habitats as well. Here in Ontario, um, here in Canada, I should say, only 12. And that doesn't seem like a lot. Now, mind you, 12,000 years ago, uh, Ontario and Canada was covered in a big thick ice sheet. So a lot of species have been slowly migrating north for all that time and some a little bit more successful than others. But here in Ontario, we can still have a lot of fun with oak identification. Uh, the diversity here, uh, 11 of those species exist in Ontario, many of them only in Ontario. Uh, and only one actually uh, that is native to Canada exists uh, outside of Ontario. Uh, and that's the Gary Oak, which is endangered in British Columbia. And to make it a little bit easier for us to identify them here, we don't have to go through 417 species. Uh, we can break those 11 species into two main groups, the white oak group, uh, which is section, section Quercus, and the red oak group, which is section Lobatai. Uh, and again, most of you will be familiar with some of the common ones here, uh, white oak and bur oak, for example, in the white oak group and red oak and black oak in the, in the, the red oak group. Uh, as you can see at the, the bottom of the slide here as well, it's giving you a little bit of an idea of some of the other groups that exist in the world. Uh, really ones we don't have to worry about too much here. Uh, Mesobalanus, for example, has a species uh, Quercus dentata, which I know I've seen some of you offering in the nursery, the Japanese emperor oaks, which aren't very cold hardy in Ontario. Certainly in the warmer parts, they do okay. Um, but something you're not going to come across very often. In the section cirrus, uh, things like the, uh, um, the sawtooth oak, for example, and the uh, chestnut leaved oak, which is actually different, different than the chestnut oak. Uh, those are two examples, the turkey oak, the cherry oak, that aren't common in Ontario. They're not native here, but if you do find a, you know, a real plant enthusiast, uh, enthusiast's backyard, uh, you might find some of those species growing there as well. They are hardy here. And the other two groups are, again, mainly subtropical, tropical species that we won't find around here at all. Now, once you've got those lists of native species broken down into the two groups, uh, there are some characteristics you can use to actually uh, determine which group they're a part of. So the white oak group, we typically think of as having more rounded leaf lobes, as you can see here. Um, some of them actually have more, uh, you know, not as deep sinuses, not quite as lobey, but more teeth-like. Um, but how they differ is that the red oak group, they typically have the really pointed leaves and they also have the very end here, these bristle tips. And you can see that on the slide, if, depending on how big your screen is. But that's something that you will see on any of the members of the red oak group, the Lobatai group, uh, those little bristle tips that will persist later in the season. And you won't see them on the white oak group. Some other characteristics are the inside of the acorn cap. 
So again, trying to use some, some photos I had here. This is actually English oak, which is not native to Ontario. Very common here. I think all of you will know this one really well. Um, it is a member of the white oak group. And uh, this is my niece's hands in the days when we could all see each other a little bit easier. But if you looked really closely on the inside of these caps, you would see that they're hairless. They're, they're fairly smooth, they're glabrous. Whereas the inside of the uh, caps of the red oak group actually have fine hairs on them. And then a couple other things to note are the caps themselves can be really, really diagnostic. So you can use them to separate the groups. The white oak group typically has kind of more warty type caps uh, with bristles on them in some cases, like things like fir oaks, whereas the red oak group uh, are kind of more shingle-like scales. And this is actually a black oak here, which has really, really shaggy scales. A red oak, uh, they're, they're much more uh, tightly attached to the cap. Uh, so those are two things you can look at to separate groups. Uh, a couple other things that you'll, you'll probably uh, notice is um, white oaks or members of the white oak group will actually have acorns that mature in one year, whereas the red oak group, it takes two seasons. So you'll see some very small looking acorns uh, the first year and then they'll mature the second year. Um, the white oak group actually will germinate in the fall. So they'll send out this radical or this root in the fall, and then they go through a cold dormancy period uh, and they'll sprout from there. Whereas the red oak group will not send out that root in the fall. They need to go through the cold period before they do that. And also as far as how they're um, distributed in the uh, environment, uh, certainly by animals planting them and, and in some cases forgetting about them so that they can grow. Um, but there is a difference in tastiness and that's based upon the uh, tannic acids that you'll see in the acorns as well. So uh, the white oaks tend to be um, quite tasty and they're gobbled up a lot more quickly in the fall. And the red oak group, they'll actually sit there longer before animals pick away at them in the spring, they'll dig them up. Um, and that's because the, the, uh, the tannic acids can leach out and then they become a little bit more palatable for animals. And I do want to show you a little bit um, uh, the identification, excuse me, the identification features for some of the different oaks you'll see in Ontario. Um, and these are ones that, again, many of you are growing, so they're, they're quite common, but they actually exist out in the landscape somewhere. And it's, it's kind of interesting to see some of the stories of them. White oak here, as you can see, is very, very broadly distributed in Ontario. Uh, it doesn't tend to like more limey soils or higher alkaline soils, so you will see gaps where it's not as common. But it's one of those big majestic uh, oaks that you will see, uh, example here, you know, classic trees that are built around in cemeteries or old neighborhoods and certainly across the landscape. Uh, I, I did show you this acorn earlier. It's um, fairly distinct in the sense that uh, it's got that warty cap, but not the bristles that you'd see on a close relative like the, uh, the bur oak, which we'll look at soon. And then the leaves themselves with the rounded lobes and noted that they'll often turn a scarlet color in the fall. Um, some of the other members of the white oak group will, will tend to stay more of a yellowish to brown color. Here we have bur oak, which is really, really broadly distributed. Uh, another one that, that if you ask someone to name an oak, they'd probably say white or red or bur oak as, as perhaps the ones that they know that exist here. Very big trees. Uh, one of the main differences compared to white oak, which is probably the one you'd mix it up with most, is that the terminal lobes tend to be broader and then they taper a little bit more. And again, you have to look at more than one leaf on the tree in, in all cases. You don't just want to rely on one because there's a lot of variability. But that is something that uh, is certainly useful for diagnostic purposes. But the acorns, if you can get your hands on them, you'll see these, these really broad caps and in some cases cover uh, most of the nut and those really bristly burr-like um, appendages that actually give it the name burr oak. And then also the, the really quirky branches and twigs, which, which does tend to distinguish it from some of the other members of the white oak group. Uh, swamp white oak, another one. Um, one thing I do want to point out, uh, all of these photos I'm trying to show in the upper right corner are actually taken of wild trees in Ontario where they exist. And I remember years ago, um, a couple decades ago at this point, uh, a class with, with Dr. Glenn Loomis, which I know probably a lot of you um, have had as well. And we had a guest lecturer who was talking about um, his dislike of native plants because he thought of them as just kind of this wall of scraggly green. And, and I've actually remembered this for all these years because I love plants from all over the world. I, I have an affinity for native plants, certainly, but I always think that, you know, even those plants from China, those beautiful ornamentals at one point were scraggly, um, Walls are green somewhere in the wild as well. And as horticulturists, we bring them out, we coddle them, we put them in better environments, we select them and we breed them, and then you see the beauty of them sometimes that is missed otherwise. 
But also the genetic diversity is so critical, uh, especially now with municipalities and conservation authorities looking to plant more seed grown trees from genetically diverse sources and also more species diversity so that we don't run into problems like we have in the past with Dutch elm disease and emerald ash borer where we've got streets lined with only one species uh, and those become less resilient to any environmental stresses or changes. So, uh, you know, looking around Ontario and seeing that these are, are different species, but also different individuals and how valuable that diversity is. And looking more closely, you can see the diversity here with the swamp white oak compared to the white oak. Uh, bicolor, Quercus bicolor, um, bicolor actually refers to the fact that the undersides of the leaves are more whitish and the upper side is a darker, uh, richer, shinier green. This is a young leaf. So those hairs will fade a little bit through the season, but you can see that bicolor, uh, uh, right through until the autumn uh, if you flip those leaves over. And the easiest way to identify this species is this really long peduncle or fruit stalk on the acorn. Uh, that is distinct. Um, you will see all the other oaks that I'm talking about or going to talk about will have acorns that attach more tightly to the twig. So if you're unsure and you happen to have those acorns, uh, look for that long peduncle and uh, you'll know you're looking at swamp white oak. Chinkapin oak, uh, uh, a beautiful species. I think we should be using it more often. Uh, if you look at the range in Ontario, uh, it's growing on, on limestone alvar pavement in some areas. It's growing on sand dunes. It's growing on escarpment. Um, it, it's a wonderful species to be utilizing in harsh environments, obviously, because it can handle them naturally. But these beautiful leaves, which can be quite variable, uh, look kind of like chestnut leaves. And the acorns themselves tend to be quite small. And what's really interesting about these ones is they do sprout in the autumn. The roots do pop out, but they will actually do this on the tree. And, and you'll see this with white oaks as well. But this example here was actually still hanging on the tree and the root had grown that much before it dropped. So it's, um, they're, they're very fast to go, which is a, uh, an interesting characteristic of them as well. The dwarf chinkamon oak is one that, um, I, I, it's overlooked, obviously. I think it's probably a little bit more broad spread in some cases than we even realize, but it really finds its niche in really harsh environments where other things don't grow well. Um, bigger species will shade it out in more favorable environments. But if you look at the map here, um, these are not actually growing in Lake Huron. There's been a little bit of a shift here, but this is around Pinery Provincial Park and Ipper Wash. So again, really uh, open sand dune kind of areas. And the same thing for, for parts of uh, Norfolk County as well and the sand plains further north. Um, this one can easily be mixed up with chinkapin oak and, and maybe one of the reasons it's overlooked a little bit more often. A couple main things to use to distinguish them if you're out hiking around and, and looking for something really rare like this is that the, the pairs of veins tend to be less than you will see in chinkapin oak. So it's kind of like an 8 to 12 versus a... Uh, a 10 to, to 14 kind of thing. So it's not a perfect uh, separation, but it is there. But the big thing is the acorns. Um, I have seen dwarf chinkapin oak produce acorns at five years old and about three feet tall. Um, you will not see that on other oaks. So they are truly dwarfs. Um, this is kind of a small tree form, but you'll often see them as a multi-stem shrub. Um, not particularly ornamental, but if you really want an oak in your yard and you don't have a big yard, you can use dwarf chinkapin oak and actually fit that diversity in there as well. Sean, you have one minute. Okay, I knew I was going to start anecdoting too much, but um, <laughs> uh, I'll just go through these really quickly. Uh, red oak is another one that you know really well, really broad spread. Um, black oak is another one that uh, is is quite quite common, maybe overlooked a little bit. Um, note the really shaggy acorn caps and the really fuzzy buds. And on the left here is black oak, and on the right is is red oak. So you can really see the distinction between the two. This is helpful in the nursery and with uh, with potted stock as well. And a little knife twist into the bark will show that yellow inner uh, cambium on yellow, uh, the yellow uh, cambium on black oak, which is helpful as well. Pin oak, note the small, small buds, uh, much smaller than black oak and red oak and the very small globular acorns with the really thin caps. Schumard oak. Um, so I just passed one here. Uh, Schumard oak here, which has the really broad, big, fat acorns, uh, auxiliary tufts on the underside of the leaves. Um, this one was only discovered in the 1970s by uh, Jerry Waldron, who you can see here with the holding the leaves in this case. So this is this is one that was overlooked as red oak for many years. And the same with hill oak, one of my favorites. Um, note the acorns, ellipsoidalis. So those are ellipsoid shaped or bullet shaped acorns. Um, this was only discovered in the 70s as well. 
and you can see the difference between black oak and hills oak here. Um, the rounded globe-like acorns of black oak and the bullet-shaped ones of hills oak and the different size buds as well. And then the last one here um, is bear oak, which is uh, only discovered in the 1990s in Canada. Um, so it's amazing to think there's a species that are still out there that we may not look at. This was overlooked for, for obviously centuries. Probably people thought they were just scraggly little red oaks growing in harsh granite rock kind of environments. But finally, someone looked closely and said, hey, these are different. They have fuzzy buds, they have fuzzy leaves, and determined that this is the same species that's growing further south on the Atlantic seaboard. And these are growing all along the shoreline very broadly of several lakes in eastern Ontario, uh, Puzzle Lake Provincial Park. Um, so it's amazing. They've been there a long time and we just overlooked them and there's probably other things out there we get to see. Uh, and just finishing off here, uh, whenever we drew the political borders, obviously, uh, we we had the ones that ended up in Ontario and some that ended up just on the other side of the border in Ohio and Pennsylvania and Michigan. So some other species that uh, are, are really close to us. A amazing amount of hybrids as well. Um, which actually I want to talk about hybrids more, but that could be a whole other talk. So we can get into that sometime in the future. But I do want to say um, we do have an oak collection here at the Arboretum. Uh, with many of these species, we've been actually adding species, things like overcup oak and blackjack oak and, and Caucasian oak. So some things you may not have seen before, but certainly all the native ones as well. Uh, it's really useful to be able to see them in one spot and identify them, uh, um, those, those contrasting features. So I'm going to leave it there and uh, we can go into some questions a little bit later. So thank you, Jen. Thank you. Great. Great. It's, 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 uh, uh, it's nice it's that there's nice not as many species, but hmm. still can be a little confusing sometimes. So our next speaker is Sharon Reed, and there she is. Uh, Sharon is the Forest Health Research Scientist for the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forests. Her research focuses on invasive diseases and pest management, and her current research includes oak wilt management, determining the risks of invasive phytophthoras, and quantifying the impacts of beech leaf diseases and forests. And she's going to be talking about these topics. So thank you. Welcome, Sharon. Hi, I'm just checking to make sure everybody can hear me and uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so um, I'm going to give you an update on my research for oak wilt um, as well as an update for beech leaf disease. Um, the title of my talk is Identifying the High Risk Period for Oak Wilt Infection in Ontario. Right, so uh, on the range of oak wilt is throughout the Midwest. Um, and in the East Coast in Texas as well. Um, oak wilt is caused by an invasive fungal disease spread by the native sap, na by native sap beetles. Um, all oaks are susceptible. Um, trees in the red oak group are more susceptible than trees in the white oak group. Uh, oak wilt was first detected in Wisconsin in the 1940s, um, but like many of our invasive species, it's thought that it was probably present as early as the late 1800s. The natural spread of the disease is slow. Oh, um, however, new detections uh, have been made outside of this larger range, as you see those, the red dots that are away from the main cluster, and those are thought to be the product of movement of infected wood. Uh, so there are, um, oak wilt has been increasingly a concern in Ontario there was the detection in Bell Island, um, about 500 meters from Windsor in 2016. Uh, Oakville has been present in Michigan, um, especially in Michigan's UP for a few decades now. Um, it is present in New York and is now being found um, a few counties away from the Niagara area. And uh, most recently we've had some environmental DNA detections of the pathogen on the body of beetles collected from wind flight traps um, at the Michigan-Ontario border. So it's not known if the DNA that was found on those beetles came from living spores or if the beetles originated from Michigan. Um, we do know that we have not found any will infected trees in Canada. Um, so this uh, so it, this is just a case that shows us how vigilant we need to be about oak wilt uh, becoming established in Ontario. 
there are two major pathways for oak wilt transmission. Um, the, uh, there's an above ground pathway that uh, is uh, uh, the spread by native nididulid beetles, and I'm going to refer that to them as sap beetles in this presentation. Um, so the way that the transmission uh, works is that uh, the oak wilt pathogen kills a tree, which is in the, the bottom uh, picture on, on the diagram. Um, the fungus then produces a pressure pad on the surfa surface of the sapwood and that pushes against the bark and causes the bark to crack. And then beetles are able to crawl through that crack down to the fungus and the fungus is sweet smelling and attractive to the nididulid beetles. Uh, those nididulid beetles or the sap beetles become co covered with the fungus. They then fly to healthy oak trees um, in order for the oak wilt infection to occur, they have to um, they have to enter a wound, so a pruning wound, some type of mechanical damage, wind damage uh, to the tree that exposes the sapwood is what is necessary to cause the infection. Um, and then, if it's a red oak tree, uh, within a few weeks, that tree can die from oak wilt. If it's um, a tree in the white oak group. Uh, the, the death of the tree could be slower or uh, it could just result in branch dieback uh, depending on the ability of the tree to wall off the infection. Uh, the second pathway is the below ground pathway. Uh, so when a tree is killed by oak wilt, the uh, fungal uh, body then moves from the, the over, over or above ground portions of the tree down into the root system and can move through grafts from the infected trees to the healthy trees. Okay. <clears throat> so the uh, management of oak wilt is, uh, can be very expensive and very costly um, in time as well. Um, so the best, uh, once it's uh, in, established on the site and has gone underground, so the best thing to do is to stop overland spread. Um, and in order to do this, you need to know when oak trees are at the most risk of infection. And we call this the high risk period. Um, so uh, this is a billboard sign from Minnesota where they've identified that May and June are the months when oak trees are most likely to be infected. And they've asked land managers and industry not to wound oak trees during that time period. Since we don't have uh, the oak wilt fungus in Canada, um, we are seeking to develop our high risk period based on the flight period of the sap beetles that are present in Ontario. Um, the research that I've been carrying out with uh, Jennifer and other partners uh, has um, aims to identify which beetles, which one of our native uh, sap beetles are attracted to red and burr oak wounds, and, and identify the time of year that they fly, as, and especially the temperatures associated with their flight. All right. Uh, using that information, we plan to develop degree day models. Uh, degree day models are based on temperature, Temperature affects the development of insects as well as their flight. And they are more accurate than using uh, simple calendar dates for determining when we should and should not prune uh, oak trees. Um, this is because we have annual variation or seasonal variation, year to year, year variation on, um, on temperatures. We have some very warm years followed by very cold years. And a degree day model will allow us to accommodate for those differences. Um, and also we're hoping that for those cooler years, it would help reduce that no pruning time period. So the, the first part of the study was to identify the potential vectors of oak wilt in Ontario. You can see in this bottom right photo, the, a picture of a wound that we've made on one of the red oak trees. 
And uh, this little bark plug that we've separated from the sapwood, we put, place that back in the tree. We nail it loosely uh, to the tree so that way it mimics uh, the little refugia or habitat area where the beetle would crawl down into the crack and hide underneath that bark plug. Um, so we collected beetles the, the first day and the third day after we made those wounds in Southern Ontario. We uh, mostly wounded the trees in May and June of 2019 and 2020. Um, we did some wounding in April as well in Southern Ontario. And then in Northern Ontario, the wounding was done in June and July, uh, sometimes in May. So uh, we ended up over the two years of the study wounding 124 red oaks and 91 bur oaks. Uh, we collected seven different species from the red oaks and we did not collect any species from the bur oaks in Ontario. Uh, we did collect some beetles um, or our partners collected some beetles from bur oaks in Manitoba. Uh, this big black beetle with the yellow spots, Pusicaius uh, fasciatus. Um, so, so we at least had one species from bur oaks uh, across Canada. Mm -hmm. um, in total, we had 194 beetles we collected from Ontario. This is a five minute warning. Okay. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> the, for the capture rate from the tree wounds that incorporates uh, not just the number of beetles we collected of each species, but also the um, uh, number of times we wounded the trees and how many trees were wounded. In our cooler region, ecoregion 5e, we had very clearly uh, three species that regularly were going to our wounded trees, Carpophilaceae, Cloptus truncatus, and Impuravara. In southern Ontario, uh, it was more of a mix. We had um, six different species going to those wounded trees, uh, but uh, we did not have any one that was um, uh, def uh, more frequently collected than the others, really. We had also did a flight survey from March to, to November 2019 and 2019, um, and we collected temperature data along with that. We ended up collecting 25,000, more than 25,000 species from, or individuals from Ontario. Uh, more beetles were collected in 2020 than 2019, uh, probably because it just was a warmer year, especially uh, it, the difference was noticed in Northern Ontario. Uh, we collected 39 species of uh, native sap beetles in Ontario. And when we looked uh, at the data, from our partners as well, we collected 47 species across Canada. So the, the beetles that were most abundant in our flight traps, so the one that was most abundant, this uh, Glycocylus quadricignatus, <clears throat> um, that, that beetle was not, it was very abundant in our flight traps, but we did not collect it from the wounds. It's not known as a vector. Um, based on the historical literature for oak wilt. Um, we did have some species like Carpiphilus percipteris and Glycocrys fasciatus that were abundant in our flight traps. We collected them from wounded trees in Ontario. There's a small amount of information in the literature about them being associated with the, the oak wilt fungus, uh, but not a lot. So I label them as PV potential vectors. Um, then there are other species like Coloptus truncatus and Carpophilus day, which were abundant throughout the study area. Um, they were collected from wounds from trees in Ontario, and they are known vectors of oak wilts um, in the Midwestern United States. Um, the earliest that we collected uh, a nidoduli or a sap beetle was April First, in ecoregion 7E, our warmest region, it was Carpophilus percipteris. Um, that same beetle species, the earliest we collected it in 5E, our coolest region up in northern Ontario was April 30th. So there's a one month gap there. Um, there, over, there was about a month and a half period, almost two months 
period um, that we were collecting beetles for the first time. So among the different species, there's quite um, a stagger between when they, um, when they start flying in the spring. So we started to do some work with building the degree day models uh, to predict when these beetles um, emerge. Um, I am just going to focus on this species, Carpophilus brachypterus, as an example of what we're doing. Um, based on the 2019 data, we uh, determined that we're collecting this beetle at 46 degree days. <clears throat> and that by 1,085 degree days, we had collected almost all the beetles um, that we collected for that year. <clears throat> we one, then- One minute, Sharon. Yep. We Thanks. then looked at the historical data, looking at the previous 30 years of temperatures and determined when in our different ecoregions, we typically reach that 46 degree days. So in our warmest region, ecoregion 70, March 31st is when we typically reach the, um, that, that number of degree days. However, there are fluctuations with uh, really warm years. We we have reached the, that number of degree days by March 14th previously, and um, in a really cool year as late as April 20th. Okay, so I just wanted to put in a, a short little plug here for beech leaf disease. <clears throat> um, I've, I've spoken about it at this uh, meeting or workshop before. Um, I wanted to let you know that there is an international conference on beech leaf disease coming up on the 15th of April. Registration was open last week. Um, beech leaf disease affects American beech and European beech, as well as Oriental beech and um, Chinese beech, or I think it's also called Angler's beech. And, uh, but here in uh, Ontario, we've only seen it um, infecting American beach and European beach. Uh, beach leaf disease, we didn't really get a, much of a chance to survey it for last year. Um, we, we try, our Forest Health Techs tried to survey for beach leaf disease um, in between their stop for CMOF surveys. But as many of you, are, are well aware that we had a lot of gypsy moth last year, um, so it took a lot of our forest health tech's time. Um, we did receive a sample from Essex Conservation Authority and uh, we're able to confirm that beach leaf disease is present. Uh, there was uh, quite a bit of survey work done in the states. They have added Massachusetts Rhode Island and New Jersey to the, the states that have beech leaf disease. Um, where, and there were also a number of new county detections in states that already had beech leaf disease. Um, in West Virginia, um, this little one with the, the stripes on it, it's a DNA detection of the causal agent of beech leaf disease, but the symptoms have not been found yet. Um, since we last spoke, I wanted to let you know that we have two papers have been published. One of them uh, demonstrates that this um, spraying uh, beech buds with a solution containing this nematode, Lytolinchus crenate mechani, uh, results in the formation of beech uh, leaf disease symptoms on beech trees uh, when the leaves unfurl the following spring. Um, that was work done with US researchers and our lab here in Ontario. Um, it was published in February of 2020. And then that was followed up with another paper um, in uh, March, 2020. I've clued, included the link to it here, um, showing that the nematode has been found throughout the range of beech leaf disease and uh, the types of tissues that it was associated with it and its ability to overwinter in some of those tissues. And that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much. There's so much work going on at the Ministry of Natural Resources right now. Uh, and uh, Sharon, it can also be reached by email. Um, if you didn't catch it, you can certainly um, go through me and she can always type her email into the chat function. 
but there is lots of great information out there. And beech leaf disease is a relatively new issue that we're seeing, and it's really neat that they've already detected the causal agent. So we are going to go on to our, our second last speaker, Ryan. If Ryan is good to go. And we'll finish with Praveen at the end of the session. So Ryan, are you okay to go now? I'm ready to go. Lovely. So if you'll just share your screen for your presentation. Sounds good. So Ryan is a research technician in the Green the Landscape Program at the Vineland Research and Innovation Center. And the team brings together expertise on soils, tree physiology, ecology and nursery production, including the establishment and survival of trees. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks for having me. If you could uh, aim to finish at 147. Perfect. Yeah, just set my timer. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, so yeah, great to be here, even though we're not here in person. Um, just also having issues with advancing my slides here. <laughs> Let's see if this works. There we go. So yeah, I'll be talking about soil uh, nursery soil health uh, We're, today. You're not you're not in presenter view on our screen, just so you know. Okay, sorry. Let me go and fix that then. Um, <clears throat> how do I do that? Because I'm sharing the screen. Yeah, it might oh, be. Oh, I see what you mean. It was just a lag. Okay. Oh, it was just a lag. Okay. Is that good? No, it's still like. A it's just not in presenter view for us. Oh, that's strange. Okay, it's in presenter view for me. Um, okay, I'm not sure uh, what I can do about that. Yeah, there's a way of flipping it and I can't remember right now. Okay, so oh, okay. make your slide as big as possible and yeah, exactly. in the interest of time, <laughs> sounds good. we'll yeah, focus let's, on let's that. Yeah, sounds good. So <laughs> I'll be talking about a project we've uh, we've been working on the last almost two years now. Um, funded through the OMAFRA CAP program um, and with uh, partners in Landscape Ontario, um, Growbark, a Walker environmental company, um, and our five, uh, our five uh, nursery partners. And I'll give you a bit more of um, info on what our nursery partners have been trialing out a little later on. So all my animations are out the window. <laughs> so I'll go with uh, um, the quickly our, our agenda today will be discussing so soil health in a nursery context. Um, trialing out new management practices. I'll try to highlight at least one uh, trial that each nurse, each of our partner nurseries has undertaken over the last couple of years. Uh, state of the industry report, um, many of you were, were generous enough with your time to fill that out. So I'll go over the kind of key from that report. And lastly, I'll talk about next steps in terms of where we're envisioning this uh, research going in the future. So uh, just to recap, I know um, Darby and Charlene uh, presented um, to you guys last year, but I'll just quickly recap um, that we went with uh, largely with the Cornell Assessment of Soil Health suite of tests um, to get a sense of, of soil health at our partner nurseries. And we like that suite for um, a number of reasons, but um, primarily because it looks at uh, physical, biological, and chemical properties of soil. Um, so it, get, it expands what we can look at. So uh, so for the physical, we, we are able to get um, predicted available water capacity, uh, surface and subsurface hardness, um, ag and aggregate stability. So basically it's water compaction and uh, erosion risk. In terms of biological parameters, we looked at um, organic matter, a sole protein index, which is basically just organic nitrogen or a proxy for that. Uh, soil respiration, which gives you a, a good idea of the amount of microbial activity happening in the soil and then active carbon, uh, which is more a more easily digestible uh, fraction of organic matter for the, for the life in your soil. Lastly, of course, we also look at soil pH, extractable phosphorus and potassium, and some minor elements. So you put those all together, and we feel that we got a pretty uh, good holistic view of overall soil health um, in a variety of different settings. And Secondly, uh, the other big reason why we why we decided to go with the Cornell Soil Health Tests, uh, despite you know a variety of potential issues, if they're based in the states, um, the cost is is rather expensive to send the samples there. But we really liked the format that the reporting came in. Um, you get a report card when you send in your soils to them, and you get a 
you get your values um, obviously listed <laughs> that diff in different units, but then you get a rating because they compare those values to their large database that they're ever expanding. Um, they've actually been getting a lot of samples coming in from Ontario in more recent years. So when you get those ratings, it's nice and color coded. It's easy to interpret. So this, for instance, this is an example from a loamy sand soil um, that clearly has issues with compaction uh, and extractable potassium. Those are the key constraints. Um, there's other issues too, but those are they highlight those in red for you to start addressing those first. So to get back uh, to get back to our nursery partners and what they trialed out over the past couple of years. Um, they all ended up kind of revolving around the same three themes uh, of cover crops, organic amendments, and the use and production of nursery compost. So you'll, I think you'll see how that comes together in a minute. Uh, partnering with Conan, uh, Conan Nurseries, we had a variety of different fields we, we have looked at, but I'll just highlight this one rental field that they uh, started renting, I think, in late 2018. Um, or early 2019. We went out there in fall 2019. Uh, we took a look at it. If you'll see on the this image here on the left-hand side, um, parts of that rental field were very, very highly compacted, um, very devoid of <laughs> soil health, of nutrients, uh, of uh, organic matter, um, a lot of issues. Uh, so basically, we were looking with Conan, with Andrew Barber at Conan, um, at ways to help prep that site. Uh, prep that field for planting the following spring. So what we ended up doing, it was getting late in the fall. Uh, Andrew um, went out with, uh, uh, Andrew um, arranged to purchase some winter rye seed, spread that out um, really late in the fall. And to kind of our, all of our surprise, we had a, like, it was a really good established crop um, by the springtime um, that was incorporated uh, along with some mechanical decompaction, uh, addition of some nursery compost and livestock manure. And because we, we with all our nursery partners, we sampled in fall 2019 and then sampled again in fall 2020, we were, we were able to see that there was a, a quite a nice bump in, in a lot of those soil health properties, um, especially the biological ones. And moving on to Hillen Nursery, uh, working with Ben Hillen, um, we, you know, there were a lot of things we could have done with Ben, but we were really intrigued by, by his on-farm composting, uh, his windrow system that he had set up. Um, so he agreed to let us install a few sensors, which you can see um, in one of those windrows there, which with which we tracked um, moisture content, temperature, um, those kind of properties throughout the, throughout the composting process. Uh, so Ben, you'll have to talk to Ben because I don't have enough time, unfortunately, to explain exactly his process. Um, but he was basically able, within two months, uh, to produce some mature and high-quality compost that he can then use on his, for his field production. Um, and he uses a combination of his, uh, you know, um, container stock calls, uh, woody material, and uh, turkey manure with bedding. So moving on to Winklemolen, uh, working with Nick at Winklemolen. He set up a really cool, uh, well, he set it up. <laughs> we uh, we uh, followed up with sampling on this um, this grid design uh, where Nick was interested in understanding what combination of soil prep, uh, either amendments or cover crops, uh, would be most beneficial, like would would act most quickly to get his field ready for, for planting the following spring. So sorghum sudangrass was used um, during the you know, the, during the summer uh, on this field. But then uh, come late summer, um, that was uh, incorporated. And then you can see there was nursery compost, livestock manure, uh, oat cover crop, and poultry manure used in um, their sections that overlapped with those amendments. And what we ended up finding um, from our sampling, both in fall 2019 and in 2020, was that maybe as you we could have hypothesized, but it was nice to, to verify that the area where there was compost, livestock manure, and um, uh, oats uh, seeded and that grew out, um, that, that's where we found the biggest increases in soil, soil health. On to NVK, and I'll play this short video as I explain what's going on here. Um, NVK is doing a lot of different uh, trialing a lot of different new things, uh, so we could only only have time to highlight one of these things right now. 
Um, this is an example of some crimson clover and oats, I believe. <laughs> Jill and Mark can correct me if I'm wrong here. But um, they figured out a way to seed it nicely. Um, and to they ended up mowing it throughout the, the growing season as a way to help build some soil structure, um, maybe fix a little bit of nitrogen with that crimson clover and prevent erosion. Um, so I think I'll unfortunately have to leave it at that, but it, again, they've tried out many, many different things and we've got another couple trials with them as well. Um, next slide and the last slide. So at Cobus Nursery, we, Nurseries, we um, we also looked at a variety of different uh, different trials that that Ben and the group there have been have been working on. But um, in terms of what I'll highlight here, it also is a soil um, is a field prep uh, trial where Ben um, also used sorghum seed and grass during his rest rest year, and then we he had access to nursery compost as well. So we said, why don't you? We suggested why don't you spread out a couple different um, amounts and see what kind of boost you get from those. So as you can see, we, we had a strip with two inches of compost that he applied, a strip with no compost, um, and then a strip with one inch. And um, the pattern there was, <laughs> you kind of, you saw a, an increase in in, um, in your soil health scores from go, uh, increasing from like decent scores just with the sorghum Sudan grass um, to better scores with the one inch and um, quite excellent scores with the two inch. Okay, and um, key findings we're, we've taken away, and this is a lot of these key findings have come from um, discussions uh, and several meetings we've had with all our partner growers um, and some of the data that we've received back. So uh, one thing that we've noticed um, is that cover crops, uh, whether you're putting them in the tree row or in, the, or in a drive row or using them um, during a rest period, can help improve soil structure and biological functioning um, very quickly. So like within a growing season, uh, that might not come up in terms of um, chemist, like increase, um, improvements in chemistry, but you'll, if you take a, a shovel out to your field, you'll, you'll see that benefit really quickly. Um, number two, we saw uh, greater soil health benefits gained from integrating different strategies, um, basically utilizing what you have available, whether you have nursery compost, um, whether you have some kind of manure um, nearby um, uh, and integrating um, those organic amendment sources with, uh, with use of cover crops. And then lastly, um, as we highlighted uh, with Hillen's um, windrow system, uh, high quality nursery produced compost can be generated on farm. And um, I mean, other, our other partner growers are also doing that as well. So. Really quickly, um, just to highlight, we haven't been as directly involved with this, but uh, Growbark has been working with MVK on a few, um, trialing out a few different uh, kind of new uh, organic amendments, uh, somewhat newly available. So uh, a mix of Enrich and Leaf and Yard Waste compost, so 50-50 mix, um, just Enrich, straight, uh, uh, straight application of Enrich, and then an application of mushroom compost along with the control. Um, so, uh, due to lack of time, I'll, <laughs> I'll point you guys in the direction of um, Katie, Aaron, or Keith to talk about uh, about these results and more, because uh, I know they've looked at a lot more. But basically, uh, we saw an, um, an increase in pH. Um, that 29, those 2019 bars um, referred to basically three weeks after these amendments were applied in the um, in 2019, and then those 2020 values are, you know, from a year later, basically. So we see an increase in in pH, especially from um, the Enrich products, and then we see um, and we see a decrease. Sorry, an, an increase in organic matter content um, in from the initial application, but then a slight decrease um, after a year. To quickly highlight some of the key uh, findings we got from the State of the Industry report, which was very exciting to us, and I think we're we're very grateful and we're very um, glad that we decided to throw this survey out to you guys because we got 29 respondents, which was uh, excellent. You've got one um, minute, Ryan. Perfect. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and we we ended up getting responses mainly from finishing nurseries uh, and um, from a wide range of, of sizes. Um, and if you haven't seen the report yet, uh, you can check it out on our website. Just scroll down on the homepage to what's new.
we found from the, the survey that the top three soil management challenges from field nurseries uh, are weed management, soil compaction, and loss or difficulty building soil, building soil organic matter. So with that in mind, uh, keep those, I mean, I, I'm sure all of you are aware of those soil management challenges, but um, we'll keep that in mind in the next uh, 30 seconds as I finish up. So basically, the main resources we found that growers currently are using are traditional practices on farm, first-hand experience, and regional practices and specialists. Um, and But the, the of the options we offered, at least, the top two resources growers would like more access to would be information on cover crop species and timing, and more comprehensive, accessible, and easy to interpret soil tests. And as far as the soil testing goes, um, feel free to reach out to us. We're working on developing a, a couple more uh, tests we can do in-house. And then just to wrap up, I think this is my last slide, uh, next steps, we're looking at continuing this research um, and hopefully getting a, a larger, um, uh, like a production cycle built into our next phase of research, looking at tree performance um, and economic analysis. And then really um, zoning in on those three key soil management priorities around building organic matter, reducing compaction, and suppressing weeds through those two areas that you guys indicated that you would like some, some more information on. So I'll wrap it up there, and I really appreciate your time. And we're here for you if you want to discuss any of, of these topics, and please feel free to talk to any of our nursery partners. I'm sure they're glad to talk to you. Fantastic, Ryan. There's lots of great work going on at Vineland. Um, or any of the, the information that you've got there, is anything available on your website or? We're starting to populate it. Um, so yeah, we have, the, uh, we have the State of the Industry Report link up there. Um, we'll be populating it a lot more and we can send that around. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. So our last speaker of this session is Praveen Saxena. And he's had a glitch with sharing his presentation, so I am going to share his presentation. I really hope I can share his presentation after all of this. Yes. Yay. Okay. So hopefully you can see that and I'll keep my microphone on because I don't have a way of turning it off, but I just wanted to introduce you. Uh, Praveen is a professor in the Department of Plant Agriculture, University of Guelph and research in Praveen's lab includes development of specialized techniques for in vitro conservation and propagation for commercially important food, medicinal, ornamental, and spiritual plant species. Currently, he's working on a network of industries uh, with a network of industries to improve production systems for value-added plants. He also publishes an online magazine, Spiritual Botany, spiritualbotany.com. Check it out, it's a beautiful website uh, to promote awareness of plant-human relationships. Welcome, Praveen. Could you try to finish off at about 2.10? Okay. Um, I'll try to do that. I'm going to start my uh, clock here. Um, just tell me, uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. So thank you, Jen. Uh, it has been a great pleasure um, <clears throat> uh, to, um, to talk about uh, some of the stuff that we have been doing at the University of Guelph. Um, and I'll just say next uh, when I need the slight change. So please, next one. So what I'm going to do is uh, give you an idea about microplants and the technology that produces. Uh, it is uh, popularly known as micropropagation. And then I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that the industry is facing today. And it is based on the talks that we have had with a number of growers in Ontario. I'm also going to suggest a potential solution. And this solution comes as a, um, in the form of a model, which we call GRIPS model, and it's named IPPS, uh, Integrated Plant Production Systems. I should also point out that the Gosling Research Institute for Plant Preservation is part of the Department of Plant Agriculture. And our mission is to save endangered plant species as best as we can. 
but the technology is also applicable to uh, commercial crops, which is what I'm going to talk about today. I'll give you a few examples of uh, IPPS application, and then I'll also leave you uh, with some ideas of the future crops that may actually benefit from the IPPS. Next, please. So what are micro plants? Well, these are the plants that are propagated in completely controlled lab environment. And in that environment, a very small piece of plant, primarily a growing bud, can be transformed into hundreds, thousands, and sometimes millions of plants. The photo that you're looking at comes from a culture that has only 100 ml growth medium and there are at least uh, 3,000 plants in there. There are many, many small buds that you, you can't uh, uh, see right now, but um, uh, they will be able to develop into, into complete plant lists when given a proper uh, environment. Next, please. So this technology is also known as plant tissue culture or micropropagation, uh, meaning micro plants are produced through micropropagation. And as the definition says, it's a mass production of uniform plants, um, uniform plants uh, from culture cells and tissues and organs. Uh, it's a really rapid process that can produce a large volume of, uh, of plants and uh, these plants are uniform. They are very vigorous. They are physiologically and genetically very uniform and they are disease free and therefore there are very minimal restrictions as far as their import or export is concerned and that is a really uh, important feature. Next please. So what it takes to develop micropropagation technology. So the uh, photo that you see on the left is a piece of uh, plant. It's actually a short uh, stem segment. It has several buds. Ideally, what we want is to develop each of the single bud into uh, a shoot, which you see on the second panel top photo. And these shoots then keep multiplying and they have multiple buds, which then again, are capable of producing more buds and so on and so forth. The process goes on exponentially, um, making hundreds and thousands of plants. Each one of these shoots then can be uh, rooted, uh, as you see in the photo on the right bottom, and they are ready to go to greenhouse and then actually to the field. Now, all of these processes are um, very energy requiring, um, primarily because the uh, piece of plant has been isolated so therefore the sugars the hormones the nutrients that were coming originally from the plants are not now available to the growing tissue so you need to provide uh, salts iron sugars vitamins hormones and a number of other products that are currently available to improve growth and development in addition to that uh, one must optimize light temperature and even the substrate on which these cultures grow for example, solid versus liquid. We prefer to work with liquid because it allows better nutrition. In order to do that, we need to create some rockers on which the cultures actually shake. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of that. Next, please. The problems that uh, we see today, and again, it's based on uh, discussions with number of growers. Uh, the number of problem is, is the inconsistent supply of high quality plants. This is particularly true for fruit crops and even now becoming even more prominent with ornamental species like chrysanthemum. Quality plants are, are, are not available because there is no system to produce them here in Ontario. Therefore, these are imported from either US or, or Europe. And by the time they arrive at our border, uh, they have already lost their physiological characteristics and um, they are tired and uh, they are not able to withstand uh, the conditions that are in Ontario for many different reasons. And therefore the productivity is, is actually much less. In addition to that, there are additional problems um, because uh, there are import restrictions. So a number of varieties that are being produced all across the globe, um, they are ready to be uh, commercialized, but we can't, um, cannot get them here because of uh, very strict regulations from CFIA and for very right reasons. We really don't want any of the new viruses 
or pathogens coming to Ontario agriculture. Of course, we are learning now as a result of the COVID variants, but this kind of situation has existed with plant for, for decades. Is there a solution? Well, there is no panacea to resolve these issues, but uh, there is a potential solution, and that is enabling Ontario growers with uh, IPPS technologies. And let me show you a couple of examples of that. Next, please. Here is the system uh, that was developed uh, at the Gosling Research Institute for Plant Preservation for endangered plant species, but it works equally well for uh, commercial um, uh, crops as well. Essentially, we start with plant germplasm, meaning that all elite varieties that are available are brought to grip and they are maintained there through micropropagation process, as I described uh, just a minute ago. Some of these plants can be kept as stock cultures um, as, a, as a backup plan. Also, they can be conserved for long term using a technology called cryopreservation, which is um, essentially keeping the plant suspended in liquid nitrogen, where all of their metabolic functions stop, but they are alive and they can be brought back to life, multiplied, and then utilized for specific purposes. In case of conservation, they go to the field and we have been able to uh, restore uh, populations of plants that were declining in, in their natural environment quite successfully. There are several examples of that in Ontario now. For today's talk, I'm going to focus on the horticulture industry and how IPPS is applied to it. Uh, so let me show you a couple of examples there. Next, please. Um, integrated uh, plant production system actually begins with disease elimination. Most of the times, not most, but many times, we can actually get a certified clean material, but in case it's not available, then we really have to, uh, to um, um, do um, some treatments to the initial tissue. Um, usually you do heat therapy, but we prefer to do cryotherapy, which is again treating the tissue with liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees Celsius. At this cold temperature, many of the viruses can be uh, eliminated. And once they are um, ready, uh, clean, then they are micropropagated and we grow them in bioreactors to create large populations or keep them in stocked cultures for cryopreservation. And these activities actually happen, uh, both of them at GRIP. And then the technology for the production of these plants is eventually transferred to uh, to the growers um, if, if they are capable and they are interested. And fortunately, there has been a new beginning recently, which I'll describe just very shortly. I'm going to give you an example um, of uh, two of the most popular crops or most profitable crops here, apple and, uh, and grapes. Uh, blueberries, of course, are also their number one crop according to farm gate value. But let's talk about apples and, and grapes first. Next, please. So here's an example of a project that we developed with Upper Canada growers. Uh, this project has been in the making for several, uh, for several years now. And in the last year and a half, it has been completely commercialized. Um, as you can see, uh, beginning from left, uh, there is one small bud. We take a few of these and put them in culture um, and they start growing. Um, then they multiply into different shoots, which we can, um, isolate, then they can be rooted uh, in the greenhouse um, and then transferred to polyhouses. And finally, as you see in the last uh, photo uh, on the right hand side, they were transferred to the field for experimental trial um, by GRIP. Um, the technology is uh, completely commercial. In fact, the um, Upper Canada growers have established a uh, plant tissue culture lab now um, where they produce these micro plants and there are at least uh, 500,000 plants propagated in the last year and a half or so. Uh, these plants are very capable of uh, growing into the field. In fact, I'm told that they do um, excellent performance. Uh, their root system is uh, enormous and they actually grow much faster uh, than the cutting propagated plants. And we hope that these trees will be um, producing the, the high quality fruits. Right now, the technology is for apple rootstocks, but we are working on 
a number of popular varieties and actually developing technologies for grafting uh, right in tissue culture so that uh, the time could be shortened uh, to get the apple plants for uh, planting in the orchard. Next, please. Um, the other project uh, that I want to mention here is uh, for hazelnuts. Uh, this was initiated um, as a result of support from Ferraro Canada, Ontario Hazelnut um, Growers Association, and Upper Canada Growers, of course, um, Ontario Centre of Excellence also supported the project. It has been in the making again for several years, uh, at least three years um, in, in my lab. Uh, again, the process starts with the micro plants, um, starting um, on the left. Uh, these were the plants that were propagated in bioreactors. In the next photo, you see they are rooting very, very successfully. And then they finally go into field conditions. Currently, there are many plants growing in Simcoe Research Station. Uh, these plants have survived well, as, as, as you can see. Um, I haven't uh, included uh, more information on this uh, due to the uh, lack of time, but <laughs> we have a cryobank now uh, at the University of Guelph where we have many, many uh, different types of germplasm molecularly characterized and in actually GRIPS cryobank. Next, please. The uh, GRAPE project is a relatively new project. Um, it's very exciting and uh, we hope that uh, this is going to create a model which will be uh, really remarkable for Ontario uh, propagators. Uh, the process again begins with uh, virus-free plants. Uh, grape varieties are not easily imported from US or, or Europe for that matter. CFIA has very strict regulations. Um, Upper Canada is uh, at this point the only <laughs> authorized to uh, receive virus-free plant from CFIA. And with the agreement uh, between CFIA, Upper uh, Canada and GREP, um, 10 different varieties were transferred to us uh, about four months ago. And um, we have been able to establish cultures of these. They have been again tested uh, for virus again. Um, of course, CFIA verified that they are virus free, but just to make sure that our cultures uh, do not carry any virus, we test them again. Uh, we use the uh, COVID facility at Brock University. Um, there is an ongoing collaboration with them. And once these uh, plants have been tested, we have propagated again. And in the photo at the bottom, you see a very new liquid uh, bioreactor culture that we have just recently developed as recent as uh, three weeks um, and these plants are very happily growing in liquid and that really um, makes us very happy that we will be able to have large-scale propagation systems for these varieties uh, very very quickly the technology then will be transferred to upper canada growers and their stock will be trained and hopefully they will be able to um, have uh, these varieties distributed uh, wherever they are needed Next, please. The next sector that could uh, benefit from microplant and micropropagation technologies is ornamentals. And as you know, it's one of the largest sector of horticulture in, in Canada, um, making millions of dollars uh, in sales. And interestingly, uh, it is expected to grow, despite the pandemic, about 2.5% per year uh, to 2025 which really makes is a uh, an industry which is second only to grain and oil seed for which Canadian agriculture is known. So therefore, there is huge potential uh, in the ornamental market here, particularly when we are not able to import many of the uh, ornaments from Europe and, um, and United States. So we need to work with our local um, varieties and, and genotypes. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, again, just to strengthen my point there, oh, sorry, one back, uh, I skipped that one. Um, so the um, all that this slide shows is um, the Ontario contributes 51% of, of the Canadian ornamental sales, which means that we do have a huge potential right here in, in Ontario for production of, uh, or introduction of new uh, new ornamentals um, in the marketplace. Next, please. 
So these are some of the examples that we are currently working with. Uh, this project is funded by COHA um, in, in uh, collaboration with GRIP as well. We are particularly working on native species that require less water, less nutrient. And this program uh, is um, run, being run by Dr. L. Sullivan. Um, his breeding program is providing these varieties. And we are also working with some of the uh, plants recommended by indigenous community, the six nations here. Uh, in Ontario and um, plants uh, that have really high um, value as well, uh, for example, orchid. So we have received uh, a really large range of, of orchid types from uh, many different countries. Uh, CFIA is very kind to us. We have, uh, um, we have been able to uh, procure germplasm under different agreements from different parts of the world. And hopefully we should be able to, um, to propagate these orchids and introduce in the ornamental market. Some of the endangered species are also of very high ornamental value. And this way we serve two purposes, A, saving endangered species and then introducing them as ornamentals. Uh, lupins are a great example of that. We just published a paper on this uh, threatened species and its ornamental value. Um, and there are many, many more like that. Interesting part is that we can actually accelerate the growth and flowering time of these plants when they are uh, being grown as micro plants. As you can see um, on the um, um, extreme right uh, top, uh, it's, a, it's a rose plant that's actually flowering in a box, which is about 250 ml um, volume. And just before that is a, um, great uh, uh, blue lobelia and this is in culture is only a month old and you can actually make it flower. Some of these technologies will um, be um, very helpful for us to promote flowering uh, in, uh, in plant species that normally do not flower. We see that in endangered, endangered species quite a bit. Um, they are uh, endangered because they are reproductively um, restricted. Uh, they have lost either the ability to reproduce or the reproductive system is impaired. However, the micro plants that we planted in nature are extremely vigorous and they flowered within the first week of planting as opposed to five to seven years that the normal uh, plants take in natural environments. Next, please. The next sector that might uh, benefit, not might, actually will benefit uh, from, uh, from the microplant uh, technology is medicinal plant industry. This is not really a very well developed industry in Ontario and in fact has a huge potential. Um, the pandemic has really made us realize how vulnerable our populations could be. And one of the primary uh, concern is the lack of immunity. Fortunately, there are many, many plants out there. They can enhance uh, immune systems. They are cheap to, um, to grow, uh, administer, and, and consume. And they can not only enhance immunity, they work on the memory, diabetes, cancer, um, cardiac problems. Um, but that's a topic of a different seminar. I just flashed a slide. This is one plant that we published very recently, uh, about a month ago, holy basil or osmum sanctum. It's a plant from Asia, Asian origin, particularly from India, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh, uh, is known to enhance immunity. In fact, a number of trials have been conducted in India that show that it gives immunity against even COVID-19. Uh, um, but this is, again, a preliminary report. Um, we haven't seen any paper, but I actually believe um, in the potential of this plant because it has been able to show uh, immunity against other viruses uh, quite well. I'm sure you probably have seen uh, psychedelics come into picture uh, now. In fact, there are many companies in Canada that have recently launched uh, their efforts and they're listed on Toronto Stock Exchange. In fact, it was quite interesting to see the other day, I saw there's an ETF that has been launched on psychedelics. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting development, probably very profitable. So we do work on psychedelics as, as well. Uh, our favorite plant is Salvia divinorum. Um, again, uh, it's part of my collection of spiritual plants. But again, um, that's a topic of a, of a different seminar. Next, please. I'm just about to wrap up in, in 
in a couple of minutes uh, based on my alarm here. Um, the uh, medicinal plants um, are sometimes the food plant that we regularly use um, and they have huge uh, medical potential. For example, the garlic, the ginger, the turmeric. Um, many of these plants or the products are um, imported at this point. And as such, we use them fresh, but the supplements that are derived from them actually have a huge market. The US herbal supplement sales are in excess of $10 billion. And many of these crops, ginger, garlic, particularly turmeric, really constitute a significant portion of it. Um, for example, um, turmeric was top seller for the last five years. Um, every year, about 5% increase in revenues. So much so that a number of companies have launched lattes and coffee beverages uh, with, uh, with turmeric, including, including Starbucks. And I think if um, these can be produced in a closed environment, um, which uh, produces plants that are free of any contamination, you can almost guarantee a very high quality consistency uh, of these medicinal products. And that's a, that's a huge opportunity for, for business in Ontario. Next, please. So what are the challenges? Um, the challenges are that it is a technology that works when it is optimized. So starting from, and I've uh, made this collage of, of pictures from different systems just to illustrate the process. So uh, tissue is isolated from, from trees and it's a problem to bring it in culture um, because the environment is completely sterile. It has lots of sugars problem of contamination. Once it is established, then it needs to go into proliferation mode uh, from one shoot to multiple, hundreds and thousands. So you need to optimize the hormones, the growth regulators. If you want to go commercial, then you need uh, a larger propagation systems. As you see on, on the bottom left picture, it's a um, rocker machine, which has boxes that actually rotate. Um, I don't have a video film to show, but uh, uh, these rotate at an uh, interval of about one minute. So the medium goes from one end to another. The plants are submerged in liquid uh, for a very brief duration. And also they are on the solid surface for another few minutes. So they have best of the both worlds, solid and liquid. And these plants are fully capable of forming um, plants. But the transplant really requires a lot of research. Do you want to plant them? Uh, with uh, mixing with some of the um, uh, microbes or not? Do you want to give them some stress tolerance treatments or not? All of these things are being investigated and they work wonders. For example, we can treat the plants in culture and liquid to give them resistance against temperature stress. We can feed them with compounds that will show their effect in about six months time when they go to the field. So all of these things are needed uh, to be optimized. Next, please. Um, in summary, then, uh, integrated plant production system is, um, is, is quite interesting approach. Uh, it's a complete system for commercial production of pathogen-free plants. Um, the best part I like about this is it's a homegrown technology. Um, it uh, really reduces our dependency on imported germplasm. It reduces the risk of pathogens. It can enhance our competitiveness in the international market and particular uh, crops. Uh, that will benefit tremendously our fruit trees, apples, peaches, cherries, nuts, ornamentals like chrysanthemum. Um, they are infected with viruses. Uh, so it's a time that we develop technologies to clean up viruses, propagate and, and distribute them. And of course, medicinal and, and novelty crops. Um, the best part of this is that you can have all of the germplasm saved in grip cryobank in liquid nitrogen, and it will be available whenever um, conditions require. Sometimes there are crop failures. There's no backup material. You can always go back to the uh, to the bank, just like a safety deposit box and get your material back. Next, please. This work would not have been possible without the support of uh, a number of agencies and, and um, government uh, programs. So first of all, um, Gosling Foundation, that really made GRIP possible. So uh, all of our operating uh, dollars come from the foundation. And then um, we have been very fortunate to get money from uh, industries, uh, associations, and 
uh, and uh, of course NSERC. Um, last but not the least, I would really like to thank the, the DOORS community who always give us the feedback and um, um, challenge us to develop new technologies to assist them any which way we can. Um, even though GRIP's mission is to save endangered plant species, but we think that all of those technologies are very helpful to support uh, growth and development of Ontario um, agriculture industry. And again, we are here to serve as best as we can. Thanks for your patience and I apologize for uh, the technical glitch. Um, I hope uh, you still were able to get um, the view of the slides. Thank you. Thank you so much, Praveen. I'm looking at a white screen right now, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> Here comes back, yay, we're back. That psychedelic fund that you mentioned is up 22% since it was born a few weeks ago. Yeah. I'm also interested in, in plant, applied plant um, companies and strategies, and they're using a lot of medicinal plants for things like end of life therapies and addiction therapy. It's absolutely fascinating. Plants are the answer. And, you know, this industry is, is a big part of that. And I'm sure many people are, are vibrating in their seats right now because they really want to work with you and they really want to clean up some of the uh, ornamental plants that, that we propagate routinely, herbaceous perennials, even like rudbeckia and echinacea. We get a lot of unknowingly uh, virus plants in and we don't often see the symptoms until well into production. And so there, there's a huge interest for, for working with you um, we hope that you'll want to work with us and, and tackle some of these issues. We would be very pleased to, to be able to do that. Well, absolutely. Uh, it will be a pleasure and, and honor to, to serve. Uh, I'm very grateful, as I said, to the, the, the Gosling Foundation. Their aim was to create a cryobank, but it is a site um, effect, if I could say so, and very beneficial one. Um, we are already doing cryopreservation, and um, the facilities are very... Um, very much available. And in order to set up independently, it will cost a huge amount of money, which is sometimes not possible. And GRIP probably is the only facility that can actually do that at this point in time. And uh, we are experimenting with a number of crops. So apple, we've been able to clean off viruses and the next is, um, is, is grape. Uh, as I said, I have made it sound relatively easy. It isn't. But on the other hand, um, if enough R&D goes into a particular crop, it is certainly possible. Um, Apple is a very good example that now we are independent. We don't need to really import uh, those plants. Psychedelics, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in, in that area. Um, so there are a number of plants that have been used for spiritual purposes uh, in different communities. And we are working uh, with indigenous community here. Some of their plants are in culture. It took us a while to convince them uh, that we're not here to, uh, to disturb how things work there. And, and fortunately, um, it took about four years to, to get their trust, but now we are in. And uh, so we are, we're working with a number of uh, these plants and, and not only Canada, but across the world. So. Wonderful. Uh, this has been a fantastic information pack session. I want to thank all of you. We're, we're running into the, the next session. There's a, there's one more session coming up after this with uh, some announcements and grower good ideas. Uh, just on the chat line, uh, there was someone who was interested in Sharon's email address. And I, I'm just got like a lots of positive feedback. Um, okay, Sharon's getting in touch with that person. Yeah, uh, caught a massive amount of male gypsy moths in our adult box tree moth traps this year. And we found that too in, in a lot of our traps, there was just such a peak in gypsy moth. And there's some thoughts that uh, if the traps are stored close to where the gypsy moth pheromones might be stored in the same facility, that it's such a, it's such a successful potent pheromone that there could be some contamination that way. But we saw the exact same thing. Is there any burning questions, no issues? Because we have to kind of end this issue so that we can get this session so we can get into the next one. 
You guys are all wonderful speakers. Thank you so much for putting up with all the glitches. Um, and if anybody has any more questions that are not being answered here, you can always email me and I'll get it out to all our speakers. And there's Abby's email there. You can take a screenshot of that too. Having trouble getting into room four, probably because I'm not there yet. <laughs> so I'm gonna mm -hmm. sign off. Thank you all so much, really appreciate it. Love all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Take care, everyone. We'll see you in session four. Thanks, Jen.